Uh, I think the microphone is off, so you just you need... turn it on? Yes. yes. Is that good? I think yeah. so. Just... Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Perfect. Testing, testing. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. <coughs> So inshallah this week we'll be continuing our discussion on the proof for the existence of God. Um, last month we covered one of the proofs for the existence of God, which in Arabic is known as the Burqan of uh, uh, Nahum, which we call the teleological argument or the argument by design. <coughs> we also looked at some of the objections to the teleological argument, in particular the objection raised by Hume, and then we also looked at the answer that Shaheed Mutahari gave to it as well. Then last month I also say that there is another objection that has been raised by Charles Dawkins. And that inshallah we'll look at it this month. But I'm going to put that off until next month. Because this month I do want to um, look at a very important question. And that question that many of you know is, who created God? Now, to answer that particular question, I have to look at a second proof for the existence of God. And the second proof is known as Burhani Imkano Fujub. In English, it translates into the proof of necessary. I'm going to change my marker. <coughs> and that is better. Contingent genes. And then there's a third proof that some of the Muslim philosophers and some of the Shia philosophers have, in particular the Shia philosophers, uh, known as Burhane Siddiqui. Okay. And in English that translates into the argument or the proof of the veracious. <coughs> Now, we're not going to look at that today, and perhaps not even this year. But this is the one we want to look at. And there's a reason why I want to look at this particular proof. Now, last month when I introduced this discussion, I said that there was a time I was reading uh, some of the works of Bertrand Russell. And in one of his works, he wrote that, I for a long time accepted the argument of first cause. Until one day, at the age of 18, I read John Stuart Mill's autobiography. <clears throat> I've got that for you in the notes that I've given you. And there, I found a sentence. My father taught me that the question, who made me, cannot be answered, since it immediately suggests the further question, who made God? That very simple sentence showed me, as I still think, the fallacy in the argument of the first cause. Now, the question that comes to your mind right now is, what is the argument of the first cause? The argument of the first cause is a very simple explanation of this particular argument. It was the argument that was proposed by Aristotle. <coughs> we will look at it today. After we look at that argument, we will see the enhancements that Ibn Sina gave to it to come up with this particular argument. But coming back to this question, who created God? I'm sure many of you have asked yourself this question, and if you haven't asked yourself this question, I'm sure your nephew, your niece, if you have children, your children might have come up to you one day and asked you, father or mother or uncle, who created God? And sometimes we stutter, and we don't know what answer to give to the child. Sometimes it's because we don't know how to explain it to the child, but sometimes it's because we don't even know how to explain it to ourselves. Now what's interesting is that Bertrand Russell or John Stuart Mills or his father was not the first one to ask this question. Very interestingly, I was reading some hadith, and there are two hadith in Usul al-Kafi, which mentioned that one day a man came running to the Prophet of Allah. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I am doomed. And the Prophet of Allah said to him, let me tell you what has been going on in your mind. 
the Khabith, the rascal, came to you and he asked you this question, who created you? This is there in Hadith. And you say, God created me. And then he asked you the question, and who created God? And you had no answer for that question. And the man said, E wallah, yes, by God, that is exactly what went through my mind. Now, the answer that the Prophet gives, I find to be very interesting. He says, ذَلِكَ wallah mahbul iman. This questioning, this doubting that you have happening in your mind, that by God is faith itself. Doubting and questioning is an important avenue for us to reach certainty. I was recently reading this book called Contemporary Islamic Philosophy. It talks about some contemporary Islamic philosophers. One of them it talks about is Shaheed Murtaza Mutahar. And I really liked a statement that it said about the late Shaheed. I just want to read it out for you. It says, the more rational Mutahari found religion, the stronger his belief became. <clears throat> he did not fear questioning misgivings, or even doubts. Rather, he saw them as indispensable to achieving certainty. And the next line is what really caught my eye. He said, he regarded doubt as an improper realm in which to dwell. He regarded doubt as an improper realm in which to dwell, but a proper pathway towards the final goal of certitude. Doubt is not a valley in which you want to dwell but it certainly is a valley that you will have to pass through to reach the peak of certitude. Anyways, coming back to the question I raised today, <clears throat> who created God? That's the question that we want to answer today, so keep that at the back of your mind and don't lose the plot as we go through this particular explanation. Now, let me go through the history of this particular argument. The history of this argument starts, of course, with Aristotle and Plato, and then works itself into the times of Ibn Sina, and then finally comes into the hands of Mullah Sadra. But when it started off with Aristotle, the argument was known as the first cause argument. And the way Aristotle argued it, he said that, well, one, things exist. Two, they don't have to exist. You look at a tree, it does exist today, but 30 years ago, or 50 years ago, it didn't have to exist. Therefore, it needs someone to bring it into existence. Now, we're going to talk about why it needs someone to bring it into existence. Some people would say, well, by experience, we've seen that anything that comes into existence needs a cause. Some will come and say that no, it's not through experiential knowledge, rather it is through an obvious knowledge, primary knowledge. It's a primary axiom, right? So, one, things exist. Two, they didn't have to exist. Three, therefore they need a cause to bring them into existence. Four, the causes cannot be infinite. They have to end up at a cause which doesn't need a cause for its existence, right? Think of a wall. That wall it depends upon another wall to be standing. The other wall, does it depend upon another wall or not? If it doesn't, then that's your wall that starts off all the other walls. But if it does depend upon another wall, then the next question you ask is, what about the other wall? Is it standing by itself? Or does it need something else to keep it standing? But at some point, you've got to end up at a wall which doesn't need another wall to support it, right? And that wall, or that being, Aristotle called the first cause, all right? The cause that did not need a cause. Now, Plato when he came, and Thomas Aquinas as well, they had a different take on this argument. <clears throat> Their argument did not look at existence, but looked at movement. And through the same argument, they demonstrated that there was an unmoved mover, just as Aristotle demonstrated that there was an uncaused cause. It's a very simple argument. But there is a principal objection to this argument. And the principal objection to this argument is, when what is so different about the first cause, that unmoved mover, that it does not need a cause for its existence? Because you have just said to me that everything needs a cause for its existence. One thing that we know is that rational arguments do not take exceptions. You can't say that, look, hey, opposites, cannot coexist at the same time in the same place except for A, B, and C. Rational arguments do not take exceptions, right? 
You say that every being needs a cause for its existence. Well, your unmoved mover, your first cause, explain to me, why doesn't it need a cause for its existence? Aristotle was not able to explain that. <coughs> On the other hand, Ibn Sina was able to explain that. If somebody were to ask you, what's the difference between Aristotle's proof, which is known as the first cause argument, and Ibn Sina's argument, the answer you want to give is, whereas Aristotle was not able to explain why the first cause does not need a cause for its existence, Ibn Sina was able to explain why is it that that first cause, by its nature and by its essence, does not need a cause for its existence. And that is what we're going to try and prove today. Is that very clear? Yes? We're good so far. All right. Okay. Now, to give you some history about it, you know that Ibn Sina used to love studying the works of Aristotle. He used to translate them. He used to write commentaries upon them as well. And he wrote two important texts in philosophy and logic. The first one was called Isharat wa Tambihat, and the second one was called Shifa. This particular argument, I believe, appears in the Isharat. And there, in the Isharat, he called it Burhan al-Siddiqin. Okay? Now, I'm not going to call it Burhan al-Siddiqin, because later on, scholars like Mullah Sadra, when they came, they said Ibn Sina had not fulfilled the arguments for this to be called Burhan al-Siddiqin. We'll talk about that later. Okay. But he called it Burhan al-Siddiqin, and Siddiqin was a word taken from the Qur'an. One of the verses of the Qur'an talks about the Siddiqin. To present this argument, he made a very important distinction. Now, if you've had a long day, and you're tired, and this is probably not the place for you to be right now, but I will need you to pay really close attention to what I'm about to say. If you don't remember anything from today's session, this is one thing that you do want to remember, okay? Now, turning to the next page. <coughs> it didn't seem as far as this argument by pointing out that, look, there is a fundamental difference between the quiddity of a thing and the existence of that thing. I'm going to explain both of them. The quality in the Arabic is known as mahiya or mahiyat. And the existence is known as wujud. Quality is also sometimes translated as whatness. Ibn Sina realized that in the corporeal world, in the real world out there, these two concepts are not separable, they're inseparable. Whenever you look at something that exists, immediately, well, it has to exist, and it has to exist in a particular shape, a particular form, uh, with a set of particular features. But Ibn Sina said, if I just stepped out from the real world, and I walked into the world of ideas, the conceptual world, in the world of concepts, I can abstract two ideas from anything that exists. The first, the idea that it does exist, one, and secondly, that it does exist with a particular form. That particular form was called the Mahiya, and its existence was called Wujud. It's very important that we be able to make the distinction between the two. What is Mahiya? Mahiya, Allama Tabatabai, in Bidayatul Hikmah, which is an introductory text to philosophy in the Hausa, he says, huwa ma yuqalu fi jawabi ma huwa. That is the answer that you give when somebody asks you, what is this thing? For example, you see a human being, somebody asks you, what is this thing? The answer that you give is that this is a, a rational animal, right? Haigone nautil, all right? You see a triangle, somebody asks you, what is this thing? What do you say? It is a closed shape with three angles, right? Yeah, side right. Exactly, all right? So a closed shape with three angles, for example, or any type of other description. It's when you describe that thing, when you define that thing for me. That's the mahiya of that thing. Now, the Muslim philosophers came and said, the mahiya of a thing can be divided into two categories. They are properties of a thing which are essential to it. For example, having three angles is essential to a triangle, right? You can't say this is a triangle of four angles, right? Because the moment it has four angles, it stops being a 
triangle. But they also realized that there were certain properties which were not essential to it, which were accidental to it. Zatiyat and Araziyat, okay? For example, a triangle could be red, or it could be green, could be big, could be small, could be one, could be two, right? But just because it's two or one, big or small, red or green, does not stop making it a triangle, all right? But you're getting the idea now. When you talk about the mahi of something, it's how it is. It's the answer you give to the question when somebody asks you, what is it? That's one concept. The second concept is the existence of the thing. Yes, in reality, the two are inseparable. You can never separate the existence of this thing from its quiddity. But in the mind, you can separate it. In the mind, you can think of it as different. Now, what is existence, and how do you define existence? In the opening line of Bidayat al Hikmah, Allama uh, Tabat Abai, he says, Mafhumul wujud badihiyun. The concept of existence is primary, it is obvious. It cannot be given a definition. You know, when you want to give a definition to somebody, you always use terms in the definition which are even more obvious, correct? If I want to define something to you, in my definition, I use terms which are even more abstract than the thing that I want to define. Is there a purpose to the definition? There's no purpose to it. You always have to use terms which are more simpler, easier to understand. The Lama Tabatabai asks, and what is simpler and more obvious than existence itself? Therefore, existence cannot be given a definition. It's something that you think about it and you understand for itself, all right? Everything has a quiddity and everything has an existence. In reality, they are together. In the mind, they can be separated. Is that clear? Yes? Okay. If that is clear, then in the mind, you can start playing some games. The first thing that you can do is you can look at the relationship between the quiddity of something and the existence of that thing. Think of any quiddity, anything that comes to your mind. And ask yourself, what's the relationship between the mahi of this thing and its existence? I guarantee you, it can only have one of three possible relationships. Not a fourth, not a second. One of three relationships. The first relationship it can have is a possible relationship. <clears throat> this is also known as a contingent relationship. It's when something can exist but does not have to exist. Think of a tree. Can a tree exist? Yes. If you look outside, there are trees. Does it have to exist? No, it doesn't have to exist. If you go on Mars, for example, there are no trees over there. It doesn't have to exist, all right? Such a thing is called a possible being. In the Arabic language, it is known as mumkin and wujud. Mumkin means possible, and wujud means existence. Most of the things that you know, everything that you see right now, it is a mumkin and wujud. Its existence is possible. I'm going to say one sentence. I just want you to store it in the back of your mind. Something which is mumkin and wujud always remains mumkin and wujud. Never changes. Conceptually, it never changes. Now, this sentence, the day you understand it, is the day that you will have a, an epiphany in your life, a transformation in your life. We will help you with that today, inshallah. The second one is impossible beings. When you think of a particular quiddity, immediately you come to realize that such a quiddity cannot exist in the real world. Of course, you can think about it. The philosophers say thinking of the impossible is not thinking of the impossible is not impossible. But when you think about that thing and its relationship to existence in the real world immediately come to realize such a thing cannot exist in the real world. Think of a ball that is entirely black and entirely white at the same time when you look at it. Can such a thing exist in the real world? It cannot exist in the real world. Such things are known as montana al wujud. Its existence is prohibited. And thirdly, 
Can anybody help me with that? There are some things whose existence is possible. There are some things whose existence is impossible. And there are some things whose existence is necessary, right? Necessary beings. Of course, in Islam, we believe that there are no necessary beings. There is only a necessary being, all right? Now, I'm just postulating the possibility of something like this existing. I still have to prove that something like this does exist. I haven't proven that yet. But I'm just putting forward the possibility that something like this could exist. In the Arabic language, this is known as wajib al-wujud. Its wujud, its existence, is wajib. Wajib meaning necessary. When the mutakallimin and the follower of the philosophers use the word wajib, don't think it's the fifty wajib. It doesn't mean that, for example, if these things don't exist, somebody is committing a sin. No, that's not the case. All right? It just means that the existence of this thing is necessary. So, whenever you think of the relationship between any quiddity and existence, either it is possible for it to exist but not necessary, or it's impossible for it to exist, or it is necessary for it to exist. Our goal in the proof that we're going to show right now is to demonstrate that there has to be in existence a necessary being as long as you have in existence a possible being. Simple as that. Now, before I come to the proof itself, there are a few points that I want to make. Let's turn to the notes that you have over there. Page number two, if you look down to important notes, number one, the key difference between Ibn Sina's argument and that of Aristotle is that Ibn Sina explained why Aristotle's first cause did not need a cause for its existence. Right? Ibn Sina demonstrated that the preposition that every being needs a cause is a fallacy. You know, we tell our children and we tell ourselves that every being that exists needs a cause. And Ibn Sina came and said, that is not true. Rather, what is the true statement? The true statement is, every possible being needs a cause, a necessary being does not need a cause. And the reason it doesn't need a cause is because existence is a part of its, existence is a part of its, of its quiddity, it's a part of its nature. When you think of that thing, existence also comes to mind as well. Now, I'm going to explain that in a much simpler way, but right now I want you to struggle through it. All right? Okay. But the fallacy that we have is everything needs a cause, and Ibn Sina, with this particular distinction that he made, he showed that no, that's not a true statement. The true statement is every contingent being needs a cause for its existence, because existence is not a part of its quiddity, but a necessary being, well, that does not need a cause for its existence, because existence is a part of its very essence itself. All right? The first. Secondly, the idea of wajib al-wujud is also different from the concept of wahdat al-wujud. How many of you have heard of that concept, wahdat al-wujud? Some of you have heard of that concept. Now, this is a very controversial concept within you know, Muslim philosophy and Shia philosophy as well. Right? Wajib al-wujud means that there is a necessary being. Wahdat al-wujud means that in the world of reality, in existence, there is really only one existence. There are no multiple existences. Everything that exists in all the multiplicity that you see is merely a reflection and a manifestation of that one existence. It is a tashkik of that existence. All right? Now, this is the terminology used by some of the philosophers and some of the mystics. The terminology that they use is the terminology of tajalli. The example that they give is, they say, look at the ocean and look at the wave in the ocean. Conceptually, yes, you can think of the wave as separate from the ocean. But in reality, when you look at the wave, does it have an existence that is separate from the existence of the ocean? It doesn't. The whole world of creation, yes, conceptually, you can think of it different. But does it have an existence, a reality, that is separate from that singular existence? They say, no, there isn't. Now, there are some philosophers, and there are some mystics who believe in this idea, but like I said, it's a very controversial idea. 
there are no Muslim philosophers and Muslim scholars who will label those who believe in Wahdat al-Wujud as, as kafir, as infidel, all right? So think about it before you want to <laughs> take on that argument. The third point I want to make, which is important, is the argument does not prove the existence of a sentient, murid, omnipotent, alim, an omniscient God, right? Qadir. All I'm trying to prove is that there is a necessary being that doesn't need a cause for its existence. Then I later have to prove that this necessary being is also all-knowing, this necessary being is also all-powerful, this necessary being also has its own will, it is also murid as well. That's a whole separate discussion on its own. Last point I want to make before we come to the argument itself is later scholars like Mullah Sadra they came and said to Ibn Sina that you really have not warranted an argument that can be called Burhan and Siddiqeen. Because just as you've made one distinction, there is a distinction that you have forgotten about. There was that question, you know, we made the distinction between quiddity and the distinction between existence. Mullah Sadra asked the question, which is principial? Which is asal? Which is primary? Is it existence which is primary? Or is it quiddity which is primary? And Mullah Sadra's whole philosophy rests on the idea that existence is primary, quiddity is secondary. And through that, and, and, and his students, or students of his school, like Allama Tabatabai, they present a third proof, which I call Burhan as Siddiqeen, and our scholars call Burhan as Siddiqeen, which is a simpler proof, but a more profound proof at the same time. We're not going to look at that today, all right? Let's turn our pages to the third page. Now, coming to the argument itself, so far, we've just been setting up the argument. And if you've been with me whilst we set up the argument, the argument itself is not very difficult. The argument itself relies upon two syllogisms. Now, the argument by design, which we covered last month, it relied upon one syllogism. This particular argument relies upon two syllogisms. I'll put the first one up. The first one, the primary or the minor premise, states that in reality there are contingent beings. There's no doubt about that, right? Look at the world around you. Yes, I apologize. I have to leave. Sure. Um, but right. I wanted to ask you, is there an online component to your lectures and discussions? I here? think they're going to be putting it up on YouTube. So um, you can grab it um, from there. Okay. Is uh, there also an, um, an online component as in like a crowdsourcing thing? So like a forum maybe that we can comment on? Okay. Maybe a Google Doc or something like that? I don't think there's a forum, but if you talk to Brother Alize, maybe he can set up a forum. Or, forum, or we do have a Facebook okay. page. I don't know how conducive that is to um, online discussions. Sorry, take that okay. In reality, there are contingent beings. I don't think anybody would deny that. I myself am a proof that there is a contingent being because I know 50 years ago, or anyways, 30 years ago, 32 years ago anyways, I did not exist, today I do exist, therefore I am a contingent being, all right? Now, the major premise says that every contingent being needs a, needs a necessary being. And as long as I can prove this major premise, what's my conclusion? In reality, there is a necessary being. Okay. All right. This is not too bad. But I've made a claim over here, and I need to be able to prove this claim. To prove this claim, I open up a second syllogism that I just presented over here. It's called a syllogism. To prove this claim. I need to open up a second syllogism. It also has a minor premise. It also has a major premise. And the minor premise for it goes this way, that every contingent being needs a cause. And this, in reality, is the heart of Ibn Sina's argument. 
is moving away from the idea that every being needs a cause to the idea that it's only contingent beings that need a cause. Now, the important question for everybody to ask over here is why? What part of this contingent being needs a cause? If you ask the scientist, he will say, well, experientially, we've seen that anything that has come into existence, well, it needs a cause. If you ask a mutakallim, a speculative theologian, right, a mutakallim will tell you, well, the reason it needs a cause is because it needs something to bring it into existence, correct? 30 years ago it did not exist, today it exists, 30 years ago something happened that brought this thing into existence, well, it needs something to bring it into existence. The philosopher, on the other hand, would come and say this. He would say it doesn't need something to bring it into existence, it needs something for existence. And what's the difference between these two? I'll talk about that a little later. And then the transcendental philosopher, like Mullah Sadra, he will say, it doesn't need for its existence, it is need itself. Now what that means, we're not even going to touch on today. Okay? Now, but let's work with this particular answer. It needs something to bring it into existence. Alright, every contingent being needs a cause to bring it into existence. You would agree with me so far? Yes. Then the last part of the argument says this way, that the cause must culminate at a necessary being. Okay. This is not very difficult. It's coming back to what we said earlier. Remember Aristotle's argument? Right? We say that, look, if this cause, if this effect is a contingent being, it needs a cause. You look at the cause. Is it a necessary being or a contingent being? If you say it is a necessary being, well, that demonstrates what we wanted to demonstrate. If you say no, it is not a necessary being, it is a contingent being, then the next question you must ask yourself is, who created that, right? So let's say this is your effect, and this is the cause for it. If this cause is a necessary being, well, QED, correct? Yes. If you say, no, it's not a necessary being, it is a contingent being, then you must ask the same question of it. Who created it? Well, if you say that this is the necessary being, well, then QED. That's what we wanted to prove. All right? But if you say no, then well, you must ask what created it. What if I say this particular um, argument keeps going infinitely? What would you say? It never ends up at a necessary being, always keeps going back to a contingent being. Sorry? What is this known in logic? So there are two things that we don't accept in logic. One is dole. Dole is a cyclical argument. We say we don't accept that. This is not a dole. This is a tasalsul. Tasalsul in English is an infinite chain or a chain of infinite regress. We don't accept a chain of infinite regress. And if you study Vidaya to Hikmah, the Lama Tabatabai over there, he says Ibn Sina has a beautiful proof for why you cannot have a chain for infinite regress. Now, you can go there and study what the proof is. But if you ask me and if you ask a number of other scholars, they will tell you it is one of the Badihiyat. Just the example I gave you, remember? I said a wall, either it depends upon another wall. That wall either stands by itself or it depends upon another wall. But at some point, it has to go back to a wall that does stand by its Self. All right. If I'm able to prove this, then the conclusion I draw from it is that every contingent being must culminate at a necessary being, which is my major premise over here, and therefore the result there is a necessary being must hold true. What do you think? All right, let me ask you a question. What if a child comes to you, eight years of age, I had a child come to me, eight years of age, or nine years of age, and they ask me who created God? What is the answer that you would give to them? 
you're going to tell them, I'm going to send you a link to a YouTube clip that uh, one of the scholars at UBC gave, and you can read all about it, and you can, you know, listen to that clip, and you'll understand the answer. Yeah? What would you say? Sorry? God is not created. He wants to know why God is not created. What? How are you going to explain this to an eight-year-old child, a nine-year-old child? God has been there for all the time. I don't know. Don't know. He says, son, you don't ask these questions when you grow up one day. <laughs> when we have that talk, we're going to you know, talk about this as well. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us examples in the Qur'an. Whenever you come across a method in the Qur'an, an example, the reason is that the concept itself is so difficult for us to understand that God has to force it into the mold of an example. Now, you're talking to a child, give them an example. Say, son, look at the donut, all right? If you ask, why is the donut sweet? What will the child say? Because there is sugar in it. Why is the sugar sweet? What will the child say? Sugar is sweet. By essence, sugar is sweet, right? It doesn't need a cause to make it sweet, right? Similarly, why do we exist? Because God created us. But why does God exist? Well, just like sugar doesn't need a reason, by essence it is sweet, God also doesn't need a reason, by essence he has existence within him. Now this whole proof that I presented to you, this is exactly what it is. And you're telling me, well, why couldn't you have just given us the example to begin with? Uh, now. I know that you really have not yet appreciated this proof. I'll confess that when I was studying it, it took me a couple of weeks or a few weeks to understand the gravity and the value of this proof. The day that you understand it is the day that you will be able to move out of thinking in a world which is constrained with time and space and all of these constraints, and you will enter the world of concepts, the world of ideals. The day that you're able to make that transformation the day that you're able to make this shift is the day that you can really call yourself a philosopher. Until that day, even if you're studying philosophy for three to four years, but you haven't made that shift to be able to think in a space that is outside time, to be able to think of concepts and purely concepts, and you cannot call yourself a philosopher. Now, coming back to what I said earlier, I went by this particular definition. I say, why does a contingent being need a cause for its existence? I say, let us say for now, the reason it needs a cause for its existence is because it needs, to bring some, it needs something to bring it into existence. Now, let me ask you a question right now. Right now, as I exist, am I a necessary being, or at this moment, am I a contingent being? I'm still a contingent being. Remember I said earlier, a contingent being always conceptually remains a contingent being. Now, we say for every contingent being, we can always ask the question, what is giving existence to it? At this moment, is that question valid for me or not? Yes, it is. And therefore, you come to realize, it's not that we need God to bring us into existence. We need God to give us existence. At every moment, at every nanosecond, at every picosecond. This is when you start thinking outside the realm of time, all right? Now, this need that we have is stemmed into our essence. This need is something that can never be separated from us. The day you separate this need from me is the day I cease to be a human being. Now, this need in the Quran is known as? In the Quran, this need is known as battle, all right? It's known as poverty. And the being that does not have needs, the being that is self-sufficient, from whom all perfection comes forth, he is known as Fakr and Ghani, right? Now, maybe you've read this verse of the Quran before, but try to think of this verse in light of what we have said today. Ya ayyuhal nas, O mankind, and all of mankind, antumul fuqara'u ilallah, 
you are the ones who are needy towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu huwa al-ghaniyul hamid. And God is the one. You know this expression in the Arabic language, huwa al It doesn't mean that he is self-sufficient. This expression in the Arabic language implies exclusivity. He is the only one who is self-sufficient. He is the only one who has always been self-sufficient, who will always be self-sufficient. Nobody but him can ever be self-sufficient. Why? Because even when a possible being comes into existence, at every moment it is a possible being, and at every moment it is poverty, and at every moment it needs, needs, and needs. Now, of course, the jump that Mullah Sadra made was to say it doesn't need, it is need itself. It is poverty itself. Now, how he explained that is, of course, a different discussion altogether. But there's also a section in the dua of Arafah, the dua of Imam Hussein. Towards the end of the dua, we cease to recite at some point. There's an addition in Mafatih al Jinan, which sometimes we don't recite. Because some scholars are of the opinion maybe Imam al Hussein did not say it because it doesn't appear in certain texts. But it is in that section of the dua that you find certain lines that you will never find in any other dua. Now, one of the most beautiful lines of the dua, the Imam says, Ilahi, my Lord, an al faqiru fi qinaya. I am poor even when I am rich. How can I not be poor when I'm truly materially poor? Ilahi, my Lord. I am ignorant even when I know. What does it mean? I am ignorant even when I know. Right? It seems like almost a paradox over there. No. Yes, even when I know, in my knowledge I need you. Essentially speaking, I am still poor. Then how can I not be, 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 be ignorant when I truly am ignorant? All right? Now, that's something that I want you to struggle with. It takes you two weeks, it takes you three weeks. You need to ask questions. You need to discuss with somebody. The moment I understood that, I saw the world differently. I saw text differently. I read the Quran differently. I understood my relationship with God very differently. And it's going to take time before you can really start thinking in the world of ideals and concepts and move away from these constraints of time and we need something to bring us into existence. No, at every moment, ask yourself, what is your essence? and what holds true of your essence as well. The third point that I want to make, and I'm going to end with that, inshallah, is now, look, when we were discussing this, we discussed the relationship between any quiddity and its relationship with? With existence. Okay, good, you haven't lost a lot. With existence. Existence in Islam, and according to Muslim philosophers, is one of the perfections. Existence itself is a form of perfection. But it's not the only perfection. Can you name for me other perfections? The names of God. Knowledge. Right? Power. Will. Any other perfection that you can think of. You can do the same thing, the same process that we went through with quiddity and existence, with quiddity and knowledge, with quiddity and power, with quiddity and power and every other perfection. And what does that mean? I'll leave that to you, inshallah. Um, I think that was about it. Coming back to the question we asked at the beginning, who created God, we demonstrated that that question is a fallacy. It's not true of God. The reason it's a fallacy is because we think God has to think that everything needs a cause for its existence, whereas Ibn Sina and some of the scholars have shown it's only contingent being that needs a cause for their existence. Necessary beings do not need a cause for their existence, and therefore this question is not valid for God. Okay. Now, any questions? Any thoughts, any comments, any objections? Yes? A oh, very random question. Uh, sure. Question. Is, is an emotion an equity? Is an emotion? Like are emotions equity as well? Or equity? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Um, emotions, um, perhaps you can say they don't exist in the corporeal world, in the kharij, but they do exist in the conceptual world, right? In the world of concepts. Um, you can think of emotions, and emotions do exist in the mind and do exist in the heart. And therefore, anything that exists either in the real world or even in the world of concepts 
is equity. Yes. Yes. Uh, when you said, how can I be so ignorant yet knowledgeable, yes. did you mean like uh, the more I learn, the more I understand I don't know? Uh huh. Um, well, that is true, that the more I learn, the more I come to realize. Um, Shayd Muntahari, in this particular book over here, um, I recommend you to also have this book, Ta'lim and Tarbiyat in Islam. I think it's a must have for anybody, especially if you're raising a family. It's a wonderful book. But over there he says that there are three stages to knowledge, quoting one of the scholars who says the first stage of knowledge, you think you know everything. The second stage of knowledge brings about humility and humbleness within you. Perhaps there is something that you don't know. And the third stage of knowledge is when you come to realize you don't really know anything. Okay? Um, but that's not exactly what I mean. What I mean to say that even when you have knowledge, for that knowledge, you need God at every moment to be gracing that knowledge to you. Right? It never belongs to you. Nothing ever belongs to you. The moment something belongs to you, you can say, I am rich. But in reality, nothing ever belongs to you. So even when you have wealth, yes, with respect, you know, when we talk about it arbitrarily, conventionally, yes, that wealth belongs to me in the sense that I have more right over it than it belongs to somebody else. All right? But in reality, we're not talking about conventions anymore. In philosophy, we're talking about reality. In reality, with respect to God, with respect to reality, do I own that thing? And we say, no, you never own anything. You are poverty, right? And therefore, even when you have knowledge, it is not your knowledge. It is God's knowledge being manifested in you, right? And therefore, even when you have knowledge, in your reality, you're still ignorant. Yes? Uh, you mean that uh, you can uh, lose that knowledge, for example, with an accident? Um, I'm saying you never had that knowledge. That knowledge was just God's knowledge being manifested within you. All right. Um, it, yes, you had awareness of that knowledge, or yes, you had the ability to use that power, but in reality, it never ever belonged to you. It can never ever belong to you. Because you are a contingent being, right? And a contingent being always remains contingent, whether it's contingent with respect to existence or it's contingent with respect to knowledge, you're always contingent. You never have that knowledge. I would recommend if um, you know we can pair up later on and just talk about what was said today. I've given you notes. I think that will be coming up um, online as well. You can just kind of reread it, um, just talk about it, talk to each other about it. Like I said, I did struggle myself with this whole idea. It took me about two to three weeks before finally it dawned upon me, and it will take you two to three weeks. But I assure you that when you make that struggle. You know, when somebody spoon feeds you an idea, you don't really appreciate it. I find that when I go through a struggle, and finally that moment comes, the moment where you say Eureka, right? You know where the word Eureka comes from, right? There was this fellow trying to find out how to determine density, and he just couldn't do it. Finally, he went to a hammam, to a bath, and he realized how to determine density. He figured, you know, because he wanted to determine the, the density of, uh, of, 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 of a crown. Right? And he said, finally realized that he could put it into water, and the amount of water that came out would tell him the volume. He could weigh the crown, and that's how he could determine the density of the crown. Because the whole idea was, how does he determine the volume of a crown? You determine the volume of a cylinder, that's very easy, but determining the volume of a crown, very, very difficult. And the moment that idea came to him, after you know, moments of struggle, he was so happy that he just ran out of the hammam without putting on any clothes. This was in ancient Greece, and ran to the king and said, I have determined how to determine the density. It was just the happiness within him. And Muslim scholars, some of them also, you know, they used to study all night, and uh, I believe Fajr Siruddin Tusi was like that as well. You know, after studying all night, finally in the middle of the night, he would have this moment of epiphany, and he would open up the windows and scream out of the windows, Ayn al-Muluk wa abna al-Muluk. Where are the princes, and where are the children of the princes? If they're thinking that they're having pleasure, they have no idea what pleasure is until they know what's happening in my mind right now. Right? So that struggle that you go through and finally come to an understanding is really worth it in life. Sallallahu Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.